Hi, this is Cameron Bowen, voice of Toy Man, and you're listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files. Recognized, Uncle Walker, D-0-1. Recognized, Jamie Catania, D-5-4. Hello team, today in the Watchtower we welcome Jamie Catania. Along with being a fan of Young Justice, Jamie has a degree in liberal arts from Bennington College with focuses on both drama and political science. He has acted, stage managed, directed, produced, written, and been dramaturged for scores of theater productions. Uh, and when Jamie and I first met, we not only bonded over Young Justice, but a very special series we're going to talk about likely nonstop today. Jamie, I am so excited to finally have you on Whelmed. Oh, I am so excited to finally be here, Rich. <laughs> we have been talking about, uh, you know, just what we might get on here to talk about for so long and just that ending of season three. Yes. Uh, yes. We knew it. We knew what it would be. We're going to tell mm-hmm. that story again, I think. Before we begin, though, I want to remind everyone that our discussion episodes draw on anything and everything related to Young Justice, including all three seasons of the series so far, the comics and the video game. If you've not seen, read, or played all the material and are spoiler wary, consider this your warning. And with all that out of the way, let's dive in. So, Jamie, I touched on a few things in the intro, but tell us a little bit more about who you are and what you do out in the world. Sure, sure. So, uh, yeah, like you mentioned, I uh, I was a drama student primarily and, and with also a concentration in political science uh, in undergrad for my bachelor's degree. And so I got to work in a lot of different areas of theater. I went to Bennington College, and the Bennington drama program is really phenomenal in a lot of different ways, but one of them is the way in which you get to work in so many different areas of theater. So, you know, different ones work better for different people, but just having gotten to experience so many different things, work on the stage management end and the design end and all of those different things. Um, Theater is such a collaborative art form that really putting yourself in the shoes of everyone that you're going to be working with is so critical to being able to work together as a team like that. So the things that are really ended up being my passion was was mostly things on kind of like the directing, dramaturge, playwriting kind of end of things. But, you know, like I said, uh, stage management is a lot of fun getting to be kind of the, the point person for all of the crazy going on with all of that sort of stuff. Yeah. You had mentioned to me, too, that you had done, you had directed at a theater camp is that what you called it yes, for like four yeah. years a family friend who's a, a a music and theater teacher in the area where i grew up right out of sort of when i was finishing up high school and and starting college i ended up i, I wasn't going to be spending the summers where i used to and so i was gonna have to find a new summer job and kind right. of freaking out about that and she brought me on board to both a, a regular summer camp that she worked at and a, a theater camp and i got the opportunity to direct for ages four through 16 and 17 towards the end groups of kids doing camp rock and other uh, like beauty and the beast and frozen and like a bunch of like disney musical kind of type things and it was it was really cool to get to do that in conjunction with my more sort of serious self-focused theater work that i was doing in school to like kind of take what I got to learn throughout the year and then kind of parrot that to younger students and, and work with them and actually build some really cool relationships with some of those kids and you know i still follow some of them on instagram and like see what they're up to and they're all like getting into college now and, <laughs> right you know well it's funny because uh because uh one of my kids is in musical theater and mm-hmm. one of the things that i didn't quite fully grasp like i get it it made sense was the productions that they do are like lion king jr uh-huh, and yeah. shrek jr right and so we were talking about writing too because we talk about writing all the time ourselves yes. but like you got to try you got to at least get your hand uh into some adaptations of some pieces to actually take them and and adapt them to a, a younger audience, right? Yeah. And so this is something that I find interesting because this translation of writing from something that's established mm-hmm. into something that needs to be translated not only for a younger audience, but just instead of just younger, using the term current audience, yes. whatever that yes. happens to be, is exactly what Young Justice is doing, right? Exactly. Taking yeah. taking material that's eighty years old and some of it really out of date. Right. And modernizing it and not necessarily aiming it, you know, translating it directly to like a younger audience like I'm talking about, but translating it to whatever the current audience is and yeah. having these these stories matter. Right. Is that something that you you felt like, OK, you're not you're oh, nodding yeah, your yeah. head. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. So so adaptation was actually so 
Very quick overview. Bennington College is a really weird place, and we don't have majors. We have this thing called the plan, where you basically write your own. Okay, the like, plan sounds. Okay. Yeah, you you write your own. This is what I'm going to do. This is what my education is. Uh-huh. And you have an academic advisor, and then three other teachers that are part of your plan committee, and you meet with them every year and say, "These are the classes I want to take. These are my goals. How can I get there?" And they say, mm, "I don't think you should take this class. I think you should take this one, or whatever, whatever." Okay, first of all, uh, that actually sounds kind of cool <laughs> to be incredible. able to create your own thing. I went to UC Santa Cruz for my first degree, mm-hmm. and the strange thing about UC Santa Cruz is, is that they had no grades. Yes, everything yeah. was all written evaluations, mm-hmm. and which was a challenge when you wanted to go do something else because yes. then they had to translate it into a grade with the written evaluation. But the, 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 the I thought the theory and the idea was interesting. This right. sounds interesting too. Bennington is the same way. We've since added you can request grades yeah. so that if you know you're planning to go right. to grad school and want to make your own life easier, that that is an option. Right. Right. But the default is no grades and you have to explicitly request them, which I ended up doing because you know, I had no idea what I wanted to do. Mm-hmm. But um, so my plan initially, a lot of my early drafts of it focused on adaptation because that is something that has always been as a comics fan and as an animation fan and as, you know, really deeply steeped in all of those things growing up. That was a huge part of the way that I experienced art was the reinvention of it for new audiences and and sometimes being that audience and sometimes not being that audience nice. and, you know, the complicated relationships with that. And so that was one of my favorite parts of doing that theater job. I will say... I do not enjoy a lot of the junior versions of musical theater scripts. I they Fair. bother me, and they bother me. Why? Why? Because Why? I don't. I have never read one that had a shred. Okay, but this. I have never read one that had gave me the sense that there was much intention behind the adaptation. Oh. Right? It's like let's take you know the the like grown up sultry aspects of guys and dolls and like make it less explicit and then move on. Rather than like actually doing so, anything like, interesting, so like de- it, right? deconstructing it and saying what's the th- what's the through line, what's the underlying story that could be effective for this current exactly. audience, and, and turn that volume up instead exactly. of just removing things. Because I'm I'm a big proponent of the fact that you you can't really write something just for kids. Like just take it and be like, this is for kids now. Well, we've changed a certain amount of things, and it's fit to kids. Right. It's like there's a, a material that is age appropriate, you know, by by our society standards, but Every audience experience things differently. So it's uh, when I'm when I was going into adapting these scripts, it's not just like you know how can I make this <laughs> shorter and right. uh, you know whatever else that is that is you know what usually goes into those junior considerations. And and was thinking more just like okay, we've got a different audience. One, this audience is a lot of parents, and so they we want it to be quick, and we want to have jokes that are you know not laboriously over. Um, infantilized you know oh, things yeah, that are yeah. like still going to be compelling to the parents that have to sit through the hour of watching this right um and then also thinking about the fact that i was also directing it so i'm like how can i write it in such a way where we're using the theater space i know we're going to be performing oh. as much as possible so like we're going to have like these ice fairies and frozen like running up and down the middle aisle because i know we have that and like things like that okay you know? yeah and yeah so um so that yes that is one of my favorite parts of, of of that job and a lot of the different creative things that i've gotten to be involved in sort of changing and well, thank you for making my job as a parent more difficult because <laughs> I went to go see Lion King Jr. and I was just smiling the whole time because my, you know, my my daughter was running around in a uh-huh. cheetah outfit and I just sure. thought it was adorable. Now I'm going to apply my my writing analysis to right. it, going like, why did they do that instead of this? Oh, uh, you can go up Thanks. to the director and be like, oh, hey, for the next script, you know, right? I'm, I'll, Rich I'll, Howard I'll, can. I will give him your give card. It the treatment. <laughs> I'm going to give him your card instead and say, how about deconstructing this? What's the through line? What's right, your motivation? Right. Yeah, absolutely. So, so let's uh, bring it to Young Justice more directly. So, when did you first watch Young Justice? Was it on the original run, Netflix, DVD? Yep. When it was airing, original mm-hmm. run. Okay. Yeah, so I, I, I remember really clearly watching um, the first two episodes. Yeah. And and being kind of like, oh, this is this is an interesting take, kind of unexpected. I didn't know who Calder was. Obviously, he was a, he was a brand new character. Right. And, right. Um, at the time, there was a lot of confusion about whether whether we were getting Dick or Tim, and and there wasn't a lot of uh, yes. And and your Robin's definitely Dick, right? Yes. Uh, no, Tim. Yeah, I know Dick. It's Dick, right? What? I'm just kidding. I'm just messing with you. Yes, <laughs> Rich and no. I have. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, uh, Cam. I am I am a, a a child of the '90s, right? And so it was. That's something that that Rich and I have talked about a lot yeah. too. Is the ways in which like we both actually love Tim. I was a big fan of Tim. Yeah. I've, if you listen to the show, not a fan of Jason as Robin, love Jason as who he is now as Red Hood. Yes. But Tim was 
yeah, when Tim first came on the scene, that was in the 90s, I was working at a comic book store at the time, and I was like, well, they're going to try this again. How's this going to work? And I was like, oh, look, they made a, a different character. Yes. Not trying to redo Dick Grayson again. Not well. They're bringing this new kid yeah. who's full of, like, hope and, like, wanting to bring joy to Batman, you yeah. know, like... Tim Drake is, is is actually one of my favorite comic book characters. I actually, in, a, in an intro playwriting class in college, I, I started writing a play about him just because I love that origin story so much. First of all, that he, just as such an outlier from every other character in the DC Universe, deduced Batman's identity. Right. And they did try and retcon that, and it bothered me, but it's fine. They were like, oh, he like let him. I'm like, no, he figured it out. No, no, He's a don't great do that. detective. Give agency to characters. Yes. Yeah. Um, and then the, also the journey of him becoming Robin and that it didn't happen right away and he kind of has these ongoing talks with Dick you know before ever really getting in the costume and being like something that needs to happen and there needs to be a Robin that was a thing too like the learning from the quote unquote mistake of Of Jason Jason, yeah but also if I remember correctly and you can correct me if I'm wrong but if I remember the reason why Tim how Tim Tim didn't just deduce who Bruce was he deduced who Dick was first Correct. because he was in the audience and was a fan of the Flying Graysons. And because he has like a near photographic memory, he knew the moves that Dick was using. And when he saw Robin footage on TV, he was like, wait a minute. I know that acrobatic move. That must be Dick Grayson. And if that's the case, oh, my goodness. And Absolutely. then the dominoes all fell. And then he like showed up in the Batcave one day, mm-hmm. basically, because... Yep. Dick was gone as Nightwing. Jason was dead. This was the 90s where everybody was grim, dark, and lots of pockets. Yep. And uh, Batman, there was a lot of people saying, like, why isn't Batman killed? We want our Wolverines. We want our Punishers. We want sure. our, right? And so they switched him over to Asriel for a year, and then people were dying left and right. And, and, and Tim shows up as this beam of hope and saying, like, you, you're broken. You need to have a Robin. And he didn't even, I don't even think he even said, like, it's got to be me. No, he was yeah. like, you, I want to help you. And so I was like, oh, this kid is like coming from the heart and saying like, you need help. Well, and you know, you know what he, that uh, is such a beautiful doubling for me. Like whenever I think about that story, it's like, not only does that work so effectively in world, but that also just mirrors so much. I think every comic book fan that has ever taken the helm as a creator of a book that they love and and that yeah. formed them right and coming into it and and bringing those fresh lenses on old ideas and yes. i love things like that me and, too and when when that gets interjected in that yeah man, Tim, Tim is tim's great and i i really want to see some more of him hopefully we'll we'll get some more we'll see how this goes the next season yeah gotta get more uh, cambo gotta get more got, yeah cambo and yep get some more cambo and and get some tim so you watched it with the original run, with all the hiatuses mm-hmm. and all that kind of stuff, right? Yeah, I was in Did high school. Did you miss any episodes while oh, it was happening? Oh, yeah. Okay, I was going to say. So, so I was in high school at the time, and I went to a Quaker school in uh, the suburbs of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and I... Okay, I want to have a whole conversation about what that even means. I didn't even know that. Okay, but okay, interesting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, we can we can get into that at some point. It's, it's uh, yeah. <laughs> it's, we'll we'll save that for another conversation. Right. But it was so so, and I boarded at school for uh, junior and senior year, and so watching TV. This was like early on in 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 terms of what was accessible streaming wise on the internet. There wasn't a lot of yeah. Uh, for sure. That was out there. There was you know some backdoor yeah things that we're not. Gonna I talk bought about. it um, digitally. And then, so when it showed up on iTunes, uh-huh. the next episode, I could watch it. So I didn't have to follow it, but, but I bought it in like November of 2010, I think. Oh, yeah. And then they showed the two first two episodes, and then it was like, it was months and months yes. until they did it again. Yes, so, it sure was. Yeah, it was just like random. So I didn't end up missing an episode, but I kept thinking about all the people on Cartoon Network and whatnot. There had to be episodes missed. Oh, yeah. And so my good friend, uh, Siobhan, and I were were watching it as they were coming out, and we would, you know, like after school, like run and like we we could uh, check out classrooms and so you could hook up your laptop to the projector in the classroom and like watch it on the screen. And, yeah. um, you know, that would work every once in a while when we were behind and when we could maybe sometimes slightly do illegal things. We were 14, don't blame us. <laughs> right. um, no. um, but then also, you know, like when we would get caught up Saturday morning, sometimes like teachers would be nice enough to be like, yeah, if, like if you like, you know, watch my kid or, you know, clean my kitchen or whatever, like you can like sit and use the TV or something. So like, <laughs> um, I don't think we actually ever cleaned anyone's kitchen. Yeah, okay. like, yeah, it's like, y- you know, like that, cause like everybody lived there, right? So oh, it was right. like, I see. we would be able to go and, um, you know, Siobhan was good friends with um, a, a married couple that lived on 
dorm that gotcha. was, one of them was her advisor and the other so if you roommates. help with the community so, the community exactly, will help you exactly they that will give us young justice and so we'd be sitting there at the end of <laughs> that week's episode of green lantern the animated series just being like complete and total crapshoot are we getting an episode this week your guess is as good as mine oh right yeah we'll see yeah and, i gotcha i gotcha yeah. so so i so i'm gonna ask the parallel questions right sure. so what drew you to even watching it from the very beginning in the first place? But mm-hmm. that ties into my other question, which is what's your history with comics before then? So you're talking, so this was in, so how old were you when the first season came out? That was 2010. So I was, yeah, uh, 14, 15, 2010, 11. Okay. Yeah. So you were just maybe a year or two older than Emily was when she was yeah, watching it, right? Yeah. So you guys are pretty close in age. Yep. So what were your history with comics before that? And that drew you to watch it from the very beginning. Sure. So uh, my first ever introduction to the the world of superheroes was on Kids WB Static Shock. Oh yeah. Okay. Good place to start. Is just doesn't get enough credit, and I just want to say to everyone that I don't know if it would hold up. I haven't gone back, but that was a great introduction. Yeah. Hats off, Dwayne to McDuffie. That. Um, yeah. So many like interesting kind of. I know a lot of them weren't new because they were adapted from those Dakota Verse comics. Yeah. But, yeah. Like, they had to make it very different from the way that those comics were originally. And so, so many interesting new takes on those characters that you don't get a lot of because DC is, is, is so steeped in those legacy things. Yeah. Um, but then we had the crossover episode, a league of their own. And I was like, who are these people? Oh, what is happening here? Interesting. Um, and that was kind of my first introduction to the justice league and to this larger world of, the DC interconnected universe. And I, I mean, I had literally no idea. What was so tell, tell us a little about a league of their own. Tell us your emotional memories of this episode. Okay. Best I can remember. Brainiac shows up and is just like getting up to some generic shenanigans. <laughs> uh, Static has this sidekick named gear who is his best friend who doesn't have any powers in the first season. And right. And it is revealed that like, Oh, he, he like, through latent exposure to like the mutagenic gas that was on Virgil's clothes, like the night that he got his powers or something, it's like been slowly building. working in his system. Yeah. Right. And so he has all of these gadgets and he, you know, has like a, he's kind of like, kind of like a hardware character in that way. He's right. got like a, like a backpack that's a jet pack. And it also has like these, all these scanners and he has like these capsules that'll do like explosions or gas or, you know, tie right. people up or whatever. And I remember, there's there's a whole first half of the two parter where they just like fight Brainiac and I haven't watched it probably since two thousand one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tell you what happens, but then there's something where Brainiac it's like oh it seems like he's defeated and then but he's managed to get himself inside of Gear's uh, backpack and then they like bring Static and Gear to the Watchtower and are like oh like you know young heroes whatever and then he manages to get into all of the Watchtower tech and of course has to build his giant narcissistic. Robot, robot in his head, own head right. with the tentacles and all of that. <laughs> Classic Brainiac nonsense. Yeah, um, <laughs> and and just like, I mean, the, the just like. So it opened your world to like, wait, it's not just these kids in this one city. Yes, and 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 I think the characters alone were were interesting, but just like there were such specific choices being taken with the DC AU at the time yeah. that were like so grounded in their own continuity and so specific, like the the John Stewart Green Lantern right. and the Shire Hall Hawk. Right. were my two absolute favorite characters right. growing up and like seeing them and being like what is, who are these people like I have just no context for it at all like what is this ring that what but is it, it but like, it didn't make you it didn't make you feel like gate kept it no. made you curious <laughs> right yes, so you're asking absolutely. what we what we call asking the right questions which yeah. is like I want to know more I'm yeah. fascinated awesome and so from there you know it was it was the the Justice League animated series it was the Teen Titans animated series and it was tough because I I was I had my my TV watching pretty restricted as a kid so it was you know give or take what I could get like I realized going back and watching the Justice League animated series as an adult uh, or like, you know, as a, as a teenager that I was like, oh, I, I missed a lot of this. It was right. like just kind of episodes here and there. And, you know, I had um, in Blackest Night, the, the Green Lantern yeah. episode and the... In Blackest Night, was that the one where John's accused of destroying yes. a planet? Mm-hmm. And I, that is one where I could probably recite every line in that entire episode too because that I had it intense. on VHS. Oh. And that will <laughs> show you, it, date this slightly. Um <laughs> I got gotcha. you. Yeah, so it was it was kind of all over the place with my exposure to that, and and so so it wasn't comics. Mm-mm, Animated no. opened the door. Yeah, right. It really, really did. Yeah, but uh, again, not Emily. Like it sounds like this exposure ended up getting you into comics because 
currently on my table. Unlike a lot of our other uh, interviews, Jamie and I happen to live in the same city. Mm -hmm. So we're actually sitting in the same room. So we'll see how this audio quality I hope is good. But I am seeing a humbling stack of uh, of uh, comics that at the end of this table that uh, he's brought with yeah. him, and we're going to talk about what those comics are in a minute. But so that definitely got you into the comics, into comics. You didn't just stop with the animation. Right. So, did you go into a comic store? Did you order stuff online? Like, what what was that transition? I I've been thinking about that a lot recently, like, assuming that we were going to talk about it probably. And and it's one that's interesting because I think every fan has their own kind of journey with that sort of thing. And so I remember, I think the first. Justice League comic that I picked up was during the Grant Morrison JLA era when it was like wow okay. everything had been kind of um you, you know how, how comics go it's 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 very cyclical it's very we're gonna break everything apart and then we're gonna bring it back to its core and yeah. then we're gonna break it apart again and then we're gonna bring it back to its core yeah yeah so we had been on a very on the heels of a very long deconstructionist era with the the Justice League Extreme and Justice League International and Justice oh, right. League Europe and Justice League Antarctica and Justice League, you know, <laughs> Task Force and, right. you know, the that weird Green Lantern hybrid team led by Gnort that was based out of Antarctica and, like, um... And, <laughs> I don't even know. Yeah, that yeah, one. yeah. We don't even need, need to... <laughs> and so someone at DC was like, give me seven people in tights put them in a satellite, and they're the Justice League. <laughs> right. And Grant Morrison was like, all right, I'm a compromise with you. They're on the moon. And DC was like, okay, that's fine. <laughs> and, and so we got the, like, we got the classic League lineup with almost all of the, the founders, but with uh, the Wally West Flash and Kyle Rayner Green Lantern. Okay, all and right. And that was the, like, the, the big seven. And so I jumped in on that with this arc called World War Three. Oh, okay, yeah. Where there was this, like, alien war machine coming to Earth, and it was uh, making everybody crazy, and then the way that they ended up beating it or something was, like, they, like, activated the latent metagenes of everyone on Earth, and then they all flew into space and, like, simultaneously punched it together or something. It was, it was some <laughs> wild, wild nonsense. Um, but I was, I was really put off by it at the time. I remember. Uh, uh, yeah, I was it like, sounds strange. Okay, yeah. <laughs> I remember being like, where's Jon Stewart? Where's Hawkgirl? Right. Why does none of this vibe with the continuity I'm familiar with? Sure. What is happening here? Because I didn't know that I was going into 80 years of history that had already been, you know, written out. Right. Um, and it took a long time to kind of get a sense for, like, where things were. And and everything that I read up until, like, like really, really recently was in graphic novel form. Sure. And so I was lucky enough that a lot of those would have... Um, not only just like you know the extra like character design stuff in the back, but a lot of character bios and pages that would like shed a right. little more context. And so I could be like, all right, who the heck is this guy with the bucket on his head? Oh, that's Orion. Okay, and like, what's Orion's do? Oh, he's with the New Gods. Okay, what's what extra funny is you said bucket on his head, and I'm like, there's like six. So I'm, I'm just like, Doctor Fate. Oh, Ryan. Oh, okay, gotcha. <laughs> yes, yeah. I the gotcha. Guy, sorry, the the guy in red pajamas with the bucket on his head. <laughs> right. Oh, oh, that's the original. Red Tornado, but it was a pot and not a bucket. Ma Hunkle. And, yep. and literally red. Yeah. Anyway. Um, and so it, it took a while of, of just like, you know, the little bits and pieces that I could get, right? And this was like, I was growing up in kind of like the weird pioneering era of the internet. So like, I, you know, like we had one desktop and computer in the house that was connected to the internet. And so I would spend just hours and hours on Wikipedia just being like, who are these people? How are they related to each other? How do they know each other? <laughs> and the series that really got me and made me a comic reader was Jeff John's Teen Titans run. Oh, which nice. is really cool to, to look back on from a Young Justice perspective because a lot of those characters are front and center in Young Justice. And so it was, um, it came off of the cancellation of the original Young Justice series, which I know you guys have talked a lot about yeah. on the podcast with Impulse, Connell, Superboy, and Tim, Tim. Robin, yeah. and Cassie. And it, it was basically uh, Cyborg, Starfire, and Beast Boy coming together to say, you know, after the death of Donna Troy, everybody has decided to, you know, we're not going to do the teen superhero thing anymore. Everybody, all of the adults are telling us that that's what's, you know, it's not safe. This was a bad idea to begin with. And they're saying, no, 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 we, we are who we are because of this community. And we are the heroes that we are because of this community and because we had this guidance right. and because we had these examples that were not just the Justice League, but our peers and that we were, you know, right. working together as a team and learning to be better people as a team. And so Cyborg constructs this new tower in San Francisco that, you know, they have a relationship with the city where the city helps with their expenses if they help to transport meta prisoners to the new meta facility on, 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 on 
um wrecker no um alcatraz alcatraz they reopened oh right alcatraz okay right 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 makes prison. sense right and so that was that was a really formative era for me where it's the so starfire cyborg and beast boy mentoring art kid flash uh tim robin connor super gotcha cassie uh, super, uh, or, uh, wonder girl and then also um Mia Dearden Speedy joins on later. Oh, and right. She is great. She's in it for only a brief period of time, and it seems like everyone has forgotten about her, and it kills me because she's a great character. And the first HIV positive superhero. Oh, that's right. I uh-huh. Yeah. I believe we talked about her in uh, the Speedy episode, Secret mm-hmm. Origins. That was a while ago, though. Yeah. So I have to go back and, and listen to that she's myself, a even. Wonderful character. Nice. All right. So we've got a bit of your history. With comics sorry, and young justice, a, l- a little bit of rambling on that yeah, subject. Yeah, no, we can cut the sorry. That's <laughs> there is no sorry on the show. So this brings me to that special series that I mentioned in the intro, mm-hmm. uh, which is, of course, the Legion of Superheroes. So listeners of the show and anyone who's met me and has any interest in comics for any period of time knows how much Legion means to me. But for consistency's sake, I'll mention again that my older brother Steve would uh, bring home comics when he was younger. Um, he's eight years older than I am, so there was some age difference there, but he'd bring home Sergeant Rock, Conan, the Warlord, and Superboy and the Legion of Superheroes, and it was on the Legion that I learned to read as a uh, five, six, seven-year-old. So we've talked about a lot about Titans, Static, Mm -hmm. right? Young Justice, we've talked about all this stuff. None of that, in none of that did you mention the Legion. Yeah. And so the Legion is the Legion is a, a a series that I bond with typically with people who are my age. Right. So I have to tell you, when when that Legion ring came up and you and I, like you said, had been talking about what we we're gonna talk about, as soon as that Legion ring came up, I was like, Well, first of all, after I stopped freaking out sure. for a while, I was like, oh, I know, I know what I'm gonna talk to Jamie about. I have my Legion person to talk about, and um, we have an age difference between the two of us, yeah. and you sent me, the first draft was a six-page outline uh-huh. with just part one uh-huh. before we even got to part two, uh-huh. uh, and it was all brilliant stuff. It was fantastic. Oh, thank you. Yeah. And then I'm like, I'm going to get schooled by Jamie on uh, on Legion, and I am okay with this. So uh, that stack of how many are there? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I, I know there's a, there's a, like a dozen co- uh, compilations, including a collection of essays. Yes. On yeah. like written essays. What's it called? Teenagers from the future. Let me see this. It is uh, it's teenagers from the future's essays on the Legion of Superheroes that I have not been um, able to find a copy of. Oh, it's a fantastic. So, um, this is a collection of essays edited by Timothy Callahan, the foreword by Matt Fraction, who I don't know, and an afterword by Barry Liga. Yeah, if comic readers are familiar, uh, he, Matt Fraction's gotten a lot of uh, popularity recently with his run on Hawkeye uh, four or five years ago and a bunch of other really good stuff that he's right. worked on. Um, so, they talk about uh, Jim Shooter here. Uh, we talked earlier uh, off mic, we were talking about there's a whole essay on uh, Mike Grell, mm-hmm. who is a classic artist from the Legion, and my brother was a big fan of yeah. because Warlord was almost entirely Mike Grell's run, yeah. both written and, and art. Yeah, they talk a lot about him and Cockrum, too. Yeah. Yep. And Warlord, you, you can see if you're not familiar with the comic, Warlord does show up in Justice League Unlimited uh, in the. Oh, Scarteris! Yes! Yep. Oh, my goodness. I had forgotten. Yep. All yep. down. Yep. With uh, Metallo doing something with Kryptonite Silver that they Banshee, found down there. Yeah, yep, uh-huh. yep, yep. So you've got to remember F- Phil Lamar doing the Silver Banshee. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so this is a this is a, I haven't even read this yet uh, because I can't couldn't find a copy of this mm-hmm. collection of essays. So how did you didn't learn to read on the Legion? No, no. So I, I don't didn't. understand anyone's origin story <laughs> with the Legion if they did not read a uh, Legion. So tell me about how this happened. Childhood memory is weird, so I'm diving into like <laughs> fair, a, a fair enough weird and twisty territory. But so some some fans, some listeners might be familiar with the uh, Kids WB series. The I don't know if it was titled as Superman and the Legion of Superheroes or if it was just it was Legion just of Superheroes. Le- it was just Legion of Superheroes. But then it, it had the Superman logo as a part of the logo. So it correct, was confusing. right? Brand, yeah, branding. Oh, just for any of you that didn't grow up in this time, branding and who they could use and legality with DC was just such a. Con- Using infuriating process, yes. um, and if you spend as much time on Wikipedia as I did learning the reasons why the Batman could not use Robin until season five or whatever, because that's when Teen Titans was canceled, and it, yeah, it's it's a whole mess. <laughs> um, 
But so the there was the series on um Kids WB that was a very loose take on the Legion. Yeah. Um, and a definitely lot- some reinventions. Yeah. Which I generally don't have any issue with. No. It did take me a little while to get used to that Brainiac five and that kind of thing. But let's let's talk about the origin and then we're gonna break down the Legion for people so that we don't start referencing people yeah. nobody's ever heard of. Because Legion, just get ready, has one of the deepest. Yeah. This is gonna be a ride, people. We we blocked off a period of time, so this yeah. is likely gonna be a multi part uh series. So let's let's start with Strap your in. origin. Strap in. So my earliest memories with the Legion are with that series, um and and that particularly the first season of that series as like a very early introduction. And I was familiar with Superman. I was familiar with Brainiac, particularly the robotic version of Brainiac from the DC animated universe, right, the first yes. Tim stuff. And I have to think that that may have been a contributing factor to making that that version because a lot of the kids of my era were more familiar with the robot Brainiac at that point than yeah. the flesh and blood. Yeah, we we go through a whole weird thing about Brainiac's history. Yeah, like we could do a whole secret origin on him flipping back and forth between being a Kaluan uh-huh, uh, yeah. organic creature to a and 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 to be fair, in the show they they don't just write it off completely. I mean, we do yeah, get true. we we do see Kolu as like as a as an android society rather than just saying that he's just this one off android right. Brainiac thing. But so so there's that show. There was. Uh, again, this is this is like a I feel like a very specific generational thing, but I remember a point at which, um, like I said, my TV watching was 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 sure. limited. My parents were like very concerned with you know like make sure you're not rotting your brain with you know whatever whatever. And I reached a point. How well did that work out? Oh, you know, I mean, I'm here talking with you for two hours about this, so I, I would say not rotted. Maybe something else happened. <laughs> Um, fall into a toxic picket pit and mutated. Maybe, <laughs> maybe there was a uh, my my internet intake was much less monitored, and I discovered because uh. this was way before internet copyright lawyers knew what they were doing, and so pretty gotcha. much the entire Superman the animated series was on YouTube, and like the entire X Men '90s cartoon was on YouTube, and like all of this stuff. So, and here I was just being like, oh, I'm not watching TV. I'm just like watching videos on the internet. This is fine. This is different. And to be fair, I was doing this in the kitchen. And if anybody had bothered to look over and notice what I was doing, I would have been caught. So it's fine. Um, <laughs> but there's a really excellent um, episode of the Superman the Animated Series called New Kids in Town. And it is it is an, a, an impeccable Legion episode in so many ways. Mm-hmm. Um the designs, first of all, the like Bruce Tim, uh, Paul Dini designs for those characters is, is updates them in interesting ways. They're sleek. They're interesting. They're, they fit with the tone of the DCAU. Um, and then the, the, the way that they work with the time travel is, is fascinating because we get not to, again, we, we have a lot of continuity to get into before some of this is going to make sense, but typically who the Legion interacted with in their like golden silver or silver age appearances was with Superboy, this idea of Superman as a kid. Right. And later the idea that he was ever Superboy as a kid was phased out. And so in this, we had them interacting with a teenage Clark who was not Superboy, but was just coming into his powers. And yes. it ultimately turned out that this instance of them interacting with him in his childhood kind of gave him some of the confidence to start not being afraid of his powers in, in a way that right puts him on the path to becoming Superman. Right. So the irony is, and, and we'll talk, I, I, if you don't mind, I'm going to bring this. Oh, yeah. The, the basic premise of the Legion is that there's teenage superheroes in the future, a thousand years in the future, mm-hmm. and that are inspired in some way, form, or fashion, depending on the take, by, the, by Superboy as a hero, uh, and to become a compilation of, of teenage superheroes from... from uh, a hundred different planets yeah. uh, to come together to make a team. And they go back in time. They get Superboy to bring him to the future so that he can teach them how to be a hero. And that go, you can watch that in the Legion of Superheroes, yeah. but they don't call him Superboy there. They call him Superman. Yeah. And, and he's also kind of, he's older too. And, and he's a little like, older. It's, yeah. it's, it, I think that is months before he moves to Metropolis. Like it's a, right. he's about to be Superman. Right. And the, in this take, he, they've gone back and they end up inspiring him mm-hmm. in a way mm-hmm. to become the Superman that inspires them. Yeah, and it's a whole, um, they, it's Brainiac, the, the robot version of Brainiac from the DCAU, brilliantly voiced by Corey Burton. Um, he, he's a 
robot and he's immortal and he's still around in the Legion's future and he ends up taking some sort of time travel device back to, to Kansas, Smallville, to assassinate Clark as a kid. And so he's pursued by uh, my favorite Legionnaire, Saturn Girl, who's voiced by, uh, if anyone is familiar, uh, Melissa Joan Hart from the 90s Sabrina the Teenage Witch. Yes. <laughs> and she's great as, as Saturn Girl in that. And then also Cosmic Boy and uh, Chameleon Boy. Right. And, which is was an interesting choice instead of liking that. I don't know why that was what they did. But um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure either. Although, I mean, Chameleon Boy would be my choice because as, as the name may imply, Chameleon Boy is a Durlin, which is an alien creature, an alien uh, character species that can shape shift, and so he can turn himself into. He's basically like a Beast Boy, but with aliens. But he can also turn into furniture and anything else. And if any of you listeners are fans of the CW Supergirl show, we see the Durlins a little bit with uh, the President of the United States, Olivia Marsden, played by Linda Carter, uh, Wonder Woman, and she she is a Durlin shapeshifter in that, and that's a whole arc. That oh, ends interesting. Up okay, there, so. gotcha. So, all right. So, in this episode. You were introduced to this idea of these other heroes. Uh huh. Uh-huh, exactly. And and then that so that's one of my favorite takes on that because it, it it's it simplifies a lot of what is really complex about the Legion down to its bare bones in a way that is really beautiful and effective, especially for the continuity it's living in. Um, All right. So let's let's pause that there. Yeah. I want to hear that thought. But let's take it back. So, so the the animated series once again introduces you to comics. Mm-hmm. When did you did, from that? Did you go and seek out the Legion and try and figure out who these characters were, or uh, did you do the Wikipedia search thing again? Yeah. So I'm a research monster, and I had um, the the new monster for Sesame Street. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Exactly. Sure. I had the the DC Universe Encyclopedia, which is uh, like a big bound book that oh, has. Yeah. Um, sections about all of their characters and it's very they'll publish new volumes and so they're very specific to the eras in which they're published because they want to give fans a chance to jump onto the books that are being published currently and so the section on the legion in that didn't dive a whole ton into the really explicit history of the continuity there was a little bit like oh you know yada 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 pre-crisis yada 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 superboy um, but the era that I was growing up in, so was, I was born in 94, which is right around when this team came into being, there's a group that's referred to as the Reboot Era Legion, which we'll get into that. But so I got a lot of introduction to who the characters were just based on that generation, that group, and then also that group at the very end of their existence that, that ran for 10 years from 1994 to 2004 crossed over with my Titans team, the Jeff Johns uh, oh, Titans team. Oh, interesting. So where, whereas the, the classic Legion got their Clark Kent Superboy, the reboot Legion got Connor. Got Connor. Uh-huh. We're going to get into that. Yeah. Okay. So that was kind of my first in comics, in continuity introduction in the issue in which their continuity was destroyed. So. Gotcha. <laughs> yeah. Um, it I was gotcha. kind of complicated, but you know. All right. We'll get into that. All right. So let's, let's, so we, we've given a little bit of, a, of an intro to who the Legion is, the basic premise of the yeah. Legion, right? I hope any of this makes sense to people well, listening. Well, yes, I hope so. I have talked about it on the show. I'm hoping enough uh, before we're getting into this, but let us, let's talk about, I want to talk about the Legion. I want to talk about like your, like the history of the Legion, who the Legion is, yeah. some of the key Legionnaires, who their powers are and who they might be. I would like to talk about kind of the parallels between Young Justice and the Legion. Yeah. Uh, and why some people, uh, including myself, were so excited to see that Legion ring uh, in a show that has taken characters that from the Titans and from Young Justice comics and from the others that we love so much, done such um, incredible storytelling with about seeing a Young Justice version of the Legion and why we're so excited about that and what potentially that could mean. Absolutely. So there's a lot of talking points that we're going to get into, but let's take it one step at a time. So let's let's talk about the Legion and talk about the history of the Legion. So tell me tell me a little bit about what the the 57, 52 different versions of the Legion's history. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I, can, I, I can share a little bit about the origin. I, I did sure. share about it in a Scream something way back in the day. Oh, yeah. Yeah, this episode will probably be airing after our review episodes of the last half of the season where we actually talk about the ring a bit. And then this more than likely will air right after that so we right. can do a deep dive in the Legion. So the original Legion comics, there were three core characters. Your Saturn Girl, right? Cosmic Boy and Lightning Lad. Yes, although he was Lightning Boy in their first appearance. Oh, yeah, Lightning Boy. So, Saturn Girl is from 
Titan, mm-hmm. the moon mm-hmm. of Saturn, uh, in which the people that live there are telepathic. Cosmic Boy, uh, actually, I don't remember his home world. It's called Brawl. Brawl, that's mm-hmm. right. And all. Yeah, although their powers are natural in the original series, it was, or in the original comic he appears in, it was because he drank a super serum that gave him magnetic eyes, because 1952. Oh, interesting. I thought the serum... Oh, Sorry, 58. That's interesting, because that's how Bouncing Boy got his powers, Correct. too, which is a whole different thing. Anyway. The Silver Age is nothing but, uh, if not a lot of recycling. <laughs> yes. A lot of recycling. <laughs> that's fair. There are also a lot of Legionnaires. Yes. So, uh, yeah. So, uh, so yes, in the continuity that I'm familiar with, he, the people of Brawl all have some level of magnetic powers because of the play, planet they live on, but he's actually an athlete that plays Magnaball, and he, uh, so he and Saturn Girl and Lightning Boy, <laughs> Lightning Lad, uh, Lightning Lad is from a home world in which they did not have natural powers, but he and his twin brother, Mecht, and his sister, Isla, uh, all crash land on a planet because they're older. The the uh, his sister, he and his sister Garth is Lightning Lad, and his sister are twins. And then they have their older brother Mech. Mech was a bit of a troublemaker. Mm-hmm. They uh, took a starship on a joyride, landed on a, either as a planet or an asteroid. Mm-hmm. Corbal, I think. Yep. Corbal, yeah. They they got attacked by lightning beasts. Yep. And it triggered basically the metagene in them, and all three of them gained lightning powers. Eventually, Ayla's powers mutate into or change into a uh, gravity related power she becomes light last thanks to some wonderful silver age shenanigans which of we'll course get into. there's a lot of that yes there's some really good shenanigans like triplicate girl becoming duo damsel when one of her duplicates dies was actually quite interesting for the time and so those carry so the three of them so lightning lad yeah. Lightning Boy, <laughs> Saturn Girl, and Cosmic Boy are on a transport. Mm-hmm. And they also have much dorkier costumes in this first appearance. Oh, yeah, it's updated rough. for even the second one. Yeah, yeah it's pretty rough. And there uh, is an attack by terrorists? I can't remember. It, it depends on the iteration. Right. And there's a, gen, there's, a, there's a guy, a rich billionaire, which is key for the time. Oh, sure. Old RJ Brandt. He's threatened. He gets saved by these three teenagers, and he... In, inspires funds they, some conversation ends up happening where they are going to become a team to help other people and then they begin this basically like a united nations thing where they have the united planets mm-hmm. where each of these planets a lot of these planets people have natural abilities on and they recruit teenagers uh one from each planet they try not to duplicate powers which becomes a shtick well, later on not just try it's in the legion constitution which right these 14 year olds wrote for themselves with subsections and parag- subparagraphs. <laughs> this is and true. It's- but the reason why I say they try is because they'll have Superboy. Right. But then they have Ultra Boy. Uh-huh. And Ultra Boy has all of Superboy's powers renamed with different names. Mm-hmm. Ultra Vision, but, Ultra Breath. Right. Penetra Vision instead of X-Ray Vision. Yes. Yeah. Right. And in his uh, original appearance, I think that was his only power. And then they fleshed him out later. Right. And then he, uh, but he can only have one of those powers at a time. Right. So, because technically it's sort of different, and also they're like, yeah, we want another Superboy on the team, <laughs> right? And Supergirl also becomes a member of the Legion at some point. So, they do have some things that are wrapped around. They sure do. Yeah, but they try to only to try not to duplicate powers, uh, if at all possible. And so, they have these representatives of these teenagers from all over the place, which I think is a really interesting take. It is. So, there's the basic original premise, but they've been rewritten forever yes and i will say too so that is that is kind of that is the core of the canon right that is the like you know uh, original original myth that has been reinterpreted many times that actual story though didn't come about until way into the continuity so when you first meet the legion they're three kind of snarky teenagers from the 21st century later after this it's always the 30th but this time it was the 21st And they come back to basically berate and bully Superboy and, like, try and get him to audition for their super exclusive super club. And then he (laughs) tell him he's not good enough. And then actually it was all a prank and it's fine and he is. And it was like a one-off, like, these Uh random kids from the future, whatever, kind of like... Right. Like, any of the silliness that we see in the Legion, or in in the Silver Age of DC Comics. But... 
these kid superheroes resonated with the audience in a way that was kind of unexpected and was like, oh, let's bring them back. Right. And so it was on their second appearance when we get the updated costumes for uh, Saturn Girl and Lightning Lad and, and that name change for Lightning Lad um, that we start to get, you know, a little bit more of what we think of as that classic uh, Silver Age Legion. And right. then eventually that origin story gets told as well. And they were a backup feature in the Superboy yeah. comic mm-hmm. and then eventually got their own comic, Superboy and the Legion. But they were in action comics mm-hmm. to adventure and a, comics adventure yep. oh so sorry they're... adventure actually i have an adventure this is really? my yeah there it is an adventure comics uh the very earliest uh earliest one i have this one is i believe this is the earliest issue that i have 1960 something uh adventure comics featuring superboy and the legion of superheroes uh this is number 378 uh, is yeah. this the earliest issue that I have? Yeah, 1969, March of 1969. So the first ever appearance of the Legion was in Adventure Comics 247, which was in 1958. And that 247 number will be relevant because numbers always are in the DC universe. <laughs> um, that's just how we roll. Um, and they, they didn't end up coming back until a year later with 267 in 1959 as just a, like another, like, oh, the Legion showed up again. And it would be after that that they would start to appear with more regularity and kind of have a, you know, this isn't just a, a, a situation that Superboy gets himself into sometimes, but a world of its own that moves and changes and right. exists outside of Clark. Conclude. Part 1. Part 2. T minus 7 days. You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. Our hosts are Rich Howard and Emily Booza. Our editor and producer is Neil Powell. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours, under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed. Well